Now, it's uh, today's perspective on life from Paris. And um, Donald Trump says, don't worry, it'll soon start getting cooler again. Really? Well, I think we can all agree that to find a scientist who agrees with that statement would be uh, near on impossible. Melting ice caps, parched fields and now horrendous wildfires sweeping across not only the west coast of the USA, but also elsewhere such as Brazil. Now, to most of us, it is undeniable that the planet is changing. And with me is Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Thanks very much for being with us on the programme today. I mean, listening to Donald Trump, the problem, I suppose, for climate change deniers, if you are one is that it's so hard to prove particularly if you think about it in the short term that the climate really is changing on a permanent basis it's it's so gradual isn't it it's hard to see with our own eyes well thank you for having me i think we've entered an era in the us and around the world where almost every adult has seen climate change with their own eyes it doesn't take a very long memory to know that Summers here and around the country are hotter and drier than they were before, and especially that the fire season is longer and more intense. Yeah, I mean, I know you specialise, obviously, in wildfires. I mean, why do you think that proves climate change? Deniers would say, of course, we've always had wildfires. Oh, I'm not saying that wildfires prove that there's climate change. The thermometers prove that there's climate change, and we don't have... Democratic or Republican the thermometers, there's no question that the temperatures are warmer. You can see it in the official records, and you can see it in many uh, signs from nature. You can see it in the decreasing sea ice. You can see it in the increasing sea levels. You can see it in the changes in the time when flowers bloom or when birds migrate. There are thousands of signals of the changing climate around us. So what we're seeing, if you'll uh, pardon the terrible analogy, you think is just the tip of the iceberg? Well, right now, we continue to live in a world where the emissions of heat-trapping gases have been increasing when we know they should be decreasing. It, it's actually likely that they'll decrease a little in 2020 as a consequence of the pandemic, but that's not the way we need to decrease them. We need to decrease them by deploying new technologies that provide the energy we need without the warming. But until the greenhouse gases are decreased dramatically, We'll continue to see warming, and that does mean that we're in the early stages of what could be a, an unending feeling series of disasters like the recent Western wildfires. Yeah, I knew, as I mentioned, you are a special, a special uh, uh, expert on the wildfires. I mean, there are other things that can be done as well to try and prevent their spread, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the way to understand the role of climate change in wildfires, which is a very important one, is that it amplifies effects of other factors that are increasing risk. And in particular, in the United States, we had a strategy of suppressing all wildfires for many decades, beginning around the Second World War and ending only 20 or 30 years ago. And that resulted in a large accumulation of flammable material especially in the context of a changed climate, that extra accumulation of fuel becomes almost explosive. And there's a lot we can do to reduce the amount of fuel buildup. We can also do a more thoughtful job about protecting the places where people live in terms of clearing spaces around homes, making sure that homes are as fire safe as possible, and making sure that when a fire does occur, we have trained, competent, protect, professional uh, fire responders, and we have a plan in place. Yeah, I mean, Donald Trump did say as well, didn't he, that put the fires uh, should actually be put down as well to, to bad forest management. I mean, is that part of it as well, do you think? Well, if we did not have climate change, we would still have wildfires, and there would be some consequences of past decisions, you know, whether to call it bad fire forest management or to call it um, an, an effort to maintain forests in a fire-free condition. We definitely have a buildup of fuels that needs to be dealt with. It would be a modest, manageable problem in the absence of climate change. Climate change transforms that into a problem that is essentially unmanageable. And the fires bring other problems, don't they, as well? For example, pollution. 
one thing that's dramatic is that people throughout California have had direct experience with uh, wildfires. And in my home, which is um, it's about 10 kilometers from the nearest fire, we've had air quality that's been anywhere from unhealthy to hazardous for about a month. You mentioned as well um, ecology. I mean, that's something you're involved in as well. I mean, global ecology, uh, and we're all sort of trying to do our bit, or most of us are anyway. Does that really help? I mean, can we reverse this ourselves as human beings, or is it too late? We can absolutely reverse climate change. And you can think about the set of strategies that are available to us in three large buckets of things. Of course, the most important thing that we need to be working on today is, is decreasing the emissions of greenhouse gases from energy and industry. And that involves primarily embracing the emissions-free technologies, uh, electricity from wind or from the sun, um, use of biomass for liquid fuels. There are a lot of those. A second basket of technologies is things we can do that actually remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And that involves a big role for ecosystems. Growing trees removes greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Restoring forests, protecting forests, removes greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And a final set of things we can do that are deeply important as solutions is to make sure that we're all as prepared as possible to deal with the impacts that climate change pushes our way, whether it's high sea levels and the implications of more severe hurricanes, whether it's wildfires, heat waves, we can be making thoughtful investments that prepare us all to better cope with the changes that can't be avoided. And knowing the human way of life and the way humans live and the way they act, I mean, is that really realistic? I mean, we just run a report in our last half hour uh, from the UN saying that all the targets of a, a nature um, uh, from 10 years ago, not one of them has been met. We have the technologies and we have the scientific understanding that we need to really solve the climate problem. What we don't have is the collective uh, political impetus. We don't have the collective will and we don't have the collective ambition. That's a hard problem. And I don't think there's a magic wand that lets us transition from the relative inaction of the last few decades to dramatically increased action. But there are lots of bright spots. Uh, the EU has been a bright spot relative to many places. Within the United States, California has been a bright spot. We can, we can learn from the places that have embraced ambitious action on climate. And I think when you look carefully at where you're seeing ambitious investments in solving the climate challenge, you're seeing places that are vibrant economically and where there is a strong social fabric. Uh, I think the evidence is very clear that there are paths to solving climate that are consistent with growing economies and with uh, vibrant communities. Great to end on a positive note. Thanks very much for joining us on the programme. That's Chris Field, Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Thanks very much.